Um, so welcome everyone to our Data for Good seminar series. Um, it's our great pleasure to have Bin Yu from UC Berkeley uh, here to give us a talk today. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to have Bin here. Uh, I think that she is really the perfect speaker for this seminar series. Um, I'll just give a, a brief bio for our speaker. Um, so Ben is one of the luminaries of the statistical world. Um, she's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a uh, fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a Guggenheim fellow, um, was president of the Institute for Mathematical Statistics. And if you look in, in her bio, I can go on and on like this for a long time. Um, she is the class of 1936 second chair in the College of Letters and Science. Uh, Chancellor's Distinguished Professor in the Departments of Statistics and EECS at Berkeley. Um, and she's working broadly in the area of statistics, data science, and, and applications. And so it's really a pleasure to have her here. Um, she's going to talk about uh, veridical data science, uh, responsible data analysis and decision making. And this is exciting because I think, as you'll see, she's someone who has been thinking deeply and for, a, for quite a long time about what it means to practice responsible data science. So um, let's all virtually welcome Bin Yu. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for having me. And uh, actually, it's kind of a good place to give this talk. Last time it was uh, at Columbia was the Trustworthy AI Workshop. And I was talking about the three principles of data science, which I'll still uh, go back to. There, I had a meeting with um, Tian, Tian Zhang and David Madigan. And at the time, the Trustworthy Workshop uh, gave me left with this verification that's like verifiable. And then Tian was saying that you need a sweet and short title, your title is too long. So three of us just brainstormed and couldn't settle on anything. And then later, Tian actually emailed me and said, how about a vertical data science? I had to look it up. I didn't know what vertical means. Uh, and that's, you know, I run my group with my group and everybody loved it. So um, that's the name. So it's really um, Tian's credit to come up with his name. So this is the um, word. I don't think it's used very much in English anymore. It's true so coinciding with reality. But in Spanish, a friend from Spain told me that where vertical CO is very, com it's very commonly used and means that uh, it's um, really reflect reality. So um, my um, life these days is actually a lot of biomedical problems. We have collaboration with Stanford and UCSF and UW, both neuroscience and, and the card cardiovascular diseases through NeuroHub and BioHub. And uh, that's also an area that I feel like we need a lot more um, trustworthy and responsible and reliable uh, data analysis or data science in general, AI, whatever you name it. And precision medicine is where I would think the frontier of uh, medicine right now. And it's really try to say that uh, all these intervention devices we have like diagnosis, uh, drugs or surgeries, we should tailor toward a particular individual. And that's too much to ask, but at least a subgroup. So that's what I'll talk about is a subgroup analysis using the three principles. And a technical view of data science is computer science, math, stat, and domain knowledge, right? It's, it's very deprived of the human interactions. So I like to really um, advocate a holistic view of data science. It's really a system and humans are very much big part of this system. It's not objective like uh, what we think most people think we are. So we have all these different steps which are interacting from domain question. And there we already have a question, how do you formulate domain problem? There's so many data out there just, um, you know, as uh, open source data. And so data collection, most of the time is not really designed as old statistical, like uh, in car making. It's really, which data do you choose that in the public domain to answer your question? And data cleaning, which one in your group is doing it? And you have all these human judgment calls we're making. And every step, I won't go through all of them. And they're not linear. The steps you often come back and you know, redo maybe data cleaning. 
and maybe you get more data. So it's very nonlinear interactive. And what I'd like to see, I think especially well fitting, as John said, to this theme, it's really, I'd like to have a quality controlled and standardized of the data science life cycle. And with human roles uh, transparently recognized, like we make all these calls and through documentation. So vertical data science uh, attempt to extract information reliable and reproducibly from data. I also want to advocate that we should have an enriched technical language to communicate. I often find that if we don't have new terms, a lot of the new phenomena cannot be described. So we should be, we shouldn't create too many new terms, but at the same time, we do new, new, new terms and evaluate empirical evidence in the context of human decision domain knowledge. It's not just about models. I feel like the whole field of data science or statistics in general, at least the view from inside the academy, is that we have too many models, not enough empirical evidence, even to tell them apart. Well, I have been a lot of time the practitioner and a lot of methods just very hard for me from the practical point of view to choose. There's not enough evidence to give me any evidence. I cannot redo everything. And the, everybody said their method is the best. And I just don't believe it. Right. So then, but there's not enough evidence for me to choose. So that part, I think we have to embrace more empirical evidence in evaluation than I have the better model than you. So the rest of the talk I want to really describe which I had a version of it already last November when I was here, I was at Columbia, is the PCS, predictability, computability, and stability for under now a new name called Revertical Data, data Science, which is a lot broader. And the second is a recent uh, case study. We just finished a paper uh, called Stat Disk for Precision Medicine, really for looking for subgroups. So PCS bring for Revertical Data Science. The paper finally appeared with like three or four years in making uh, with my former student Khan Kumbir appeared in PNS. It's really tried to abridge Leo Bryman's two cultures. If you know that paper in 201 and Leo was one of the you know, really pioneers from the statistical side on machine learning. And predictability was really in statistics, but we really didn't put it in the center and machine learning put predictability at the center. So, Computability, definitely, you know, institution did do numerical optimization, but never said you have to worry about computability upfront. And stability is really a generalization of uh, uncertainty to all the different steps in the data science life cycle. So this framework int intends to unify, streamline, and expand on ideas and best practice in both machine learning and statistics so that the people who come we can use this framework, the concepts, the uh, framing, so that we can do better collectively and develop together. What I like about PCS is also, it really, I feel like data science really a field, both uh, scientific and engineering, that predictability and stability really embed two basic scientific principles, prediction and replication. And computability has this engineering flavor, definitely computer science. Not just, but computability under PCS is not just scalability. How fast algorithm converge and how do you store the data? I would like to really include a component, which is data inspired simulations, which is very much live and useful in even uh, chemistry or astronomy. Right? People do a lot of very well thought out simulation studies and often that's the data they have. So I think in data science and statistics and AI, we need to think about how to use this well thought out and with design principle simulations that we can argument what do we learn from real data. A lot of times like, it's almost like the um, dual image of theoretical analysis. Theoretical analysis, we have more constraints in a way. Sometimes we have to put condition because of limited analytical tools. And simulation can really argument it and go to areas that we maybe don't have this uh, analytical machinery here. But it's not really, we all do some simulations, but it's not really well thought out or well, uh, I would say, uh, principled. So I think this is an area which the paper, to be honest, didn't really go there. We defined it as an area I'm very interested in. Hope some of you will join forces to do that. And also it's a way to vet different algorithms. And in causal inference, uh, 
the community, actually they have batteries of uh, simulations and then the different methods are compared. I think that's a really good step forward. So I was, I go down the path of stability or PCS about 10 years ago. And um, at the time I had the opportunity to give the two key lecture. I was trying really, really hard to connect. At the time I was working on some uh, lasso problems and with neuroscience trying to interpret and thinking that realizing lasso is really not very uh, stable relative to data perturbation. And two key was really the um, started the field of robustity, it's very much model perturbation. So I'll try to unify and end up just putting them together, say that you want stability principle and it's a minimum requirement for interoperability, reproducibility. And now have been doing some causal inference for hypothesis generation and possibly intervention design. And the idea is that if you have causality, you have stability, but, um, and predictability. And predictability, can be really enhanced by stability consideration. I will show you in the case study. And the perturbations try to unify stability from numerical analysis, stability from dynamic systems, and bootstrap sensitivity analysis in Bayesian inference. Just put it under the same umbrella so we can see them and compare them. And um, so that we can really take advantage of all the different threads of thoughts and practices. In the paper, I actually try to define stability, which is now being expanded its reproducibility is imperative for any scientific discovery. More often than not, modern scientific finding rely on statistical analysis, high dimensional data. At a minimum, reproducibility manifests itself in stability of statistical results relative to reasonable perturbation to data and to the model used. So the reasonable, that's the thing, you have to use documentation to make a case. So over the last seven years, with my group and collaborators and students, I've been expanding this uh, both predictability and stability to the whole data science life cycle. So the first attempt was really about modeling that we used to do. Now really looking at the whole process through the lens of predictability and stability. So for domain question, predictability really is a surrogate for thinking about the future. You never really try to get a classification for the data you have. You always have something else you want to apply to. So that's the future, it's the other data. So keep that in mind. Now maybe we'll call transfer learning. And stability, you mean the domain formulation stage that we often have multidisciplinary teams working together. There's, there's a question of linguistic stability, which is a term I didn't invent, that's, that's a term in linguist. Is that whether the term means the same thing across different teams. I had an opportunity to talk to a cancer um, um, researcher. She used matrix in her theory, now well accepted. Uh, they're looking at cancer as an organ, as a micro environment, not just, you know, kind of disorganized cells. But her matrix is very different, the matrix, you know, most of people here mean. And over dinner, I tried to tell her I have a different interpretation or meaning of matrix, it never came across. So I'm saying that even at the linguistic level, we need to have stability that the same word means the same thing for everybody in the team. And then data cleaning is another data perturbation we don't consider. Like, there are different ways to clean the data, would you get the same result? And there are you know, cases that you might not. There was a famous uh, study about growth and debt uh, about 10 years ago. Many government use it for a basis for austerity. But when you, they somehow, the original team didn't um, use three data points from New Zealand. One was added on later by another team of economists, then the conclusion didn't hold, right? So this is something very impact the um, uh, economic policy internationally and just three data points and some coding error. So all of this, and then we go to the data perturbation and model perturbation. And then even data visualization, if you do different subsets of data, you usually have to downside the data, would you get the same pattern? And language level, how do you interpret which data, which result you pick to represent? So the PCS uh, framework includes the PCS workflow, basically think about all P, C, and S, in all the steps. And then we also develop PCS inference, which we have a separate paper I will talk about maybe in another talk, but right now uh, I'll concentrate on kind of towards PCS in the precision medicine problem. So have perturbation intervals instead of confidence intervals to take into account other perturbations, which hard to integrate under the probabilistic framework, like models, you know, uh, you can find important gene use lasso or you can use random forest. 
you have you should consolidate both and have some report instead of saying, well, I have two different recommendations. And the, the, the case study I'll get to is really precision uh, medicine for drugs. That was from a randomized trial. And usually people look at every treatment effect. But the frontier causal inference is really much about heterogeneous treatment effect. Can you find individual treatment or usually subgroup treatment? And the particular um, clinical trial we're looking at was about um, 20 years ago. And there's this Yox drug, which is kind of like uh, Advil, but it's called NSAID. It's this a class of drugs that um, not using steroid to um, combat um, inflammation and relieve uh, pain and um, other inflammatory um, symptoms. And this work is called a selective NSAID, which is try to target the two enzymes, usually these type of drugs, target one's COX-1, one's COX-2, this is supposed to um, target uh, COX-1. But it was found there was a vascular um, disease can increase some vascular disease by blood clotting. And, and so the study was done compared with an older drug called uh, naproxen. And that's what I was saying, that it's a selective NSAID and um, it seemed to have lower increased risk for GI event like ulcers, bleeding, and perforations, but increased heart, um, some uh, vascular disease risk. And in 2004, Merck was the producer of this drug, decided to withdraw uh, Wiox from the market. So what we're looking at is this study, Wiox study from 2001 to 2004. And thrombotic means a clotting. So basically you have more um, blood clot that can cause heart attack. Now I think it's out of market. And what we try to do there is really try to find subgroups that have predictive performance, which we have to generalize from supervised learning to causal inference and stable and interpretable. And we actually have an external study that basically uh, validated most of our findings. Nothing contradicted our findings, some just not supported because we don't have data in the smaller study. So this is, keep that in mind that we didn't have the option to, we did, we have the option to do some data cleaning, which I will um, uh, tell you, but it's already, you know, um, uh, in a database that we had access to. So actually David Madigan, that's um, part of, David visited my group about a year and a half ago. So that's the project started. So the data perturbation um, under the so-called IID, like weekly dependent symmetric condition, we already have three forms and we usually choose one form. So it's like already there, you should ask stability whether you get the same result. And Leo Bryman was always fond of adding small noise to data and you can fit the model and look at the residuals. So there are different forms. And, um, but mostly we're most comfortable with the forms when we have more or less approximately IID condition, weekly dependent and uh, uh, symmetry. And the more recent form, which I like to include in under this PCS umbrella is actually model modality perturbation. It's not just perturbing the same data, it's adding other data collected under other, um, um, like genomic data, you have protomic data, you have genomic data, and also PDE data, right? Can you, I can look at that as a form of data perturbation too. For, for robotic arm study, right? You can have graduate student reach for a battle, bottle, or you can use some PDE to, mechanistic simulate uh, arm and then reach for a bottle. And you can put them together, serve as like a shrinkage to a manifold. And under different um, environments, you can have a different um, kind of like mechanisms and people use that as for causality pursuit, goes back to economic in the 40s and privacy and also adversary attacks. It's extreme form of data perturbation. So all of this can be considered under the broad umbrella of data perturbation. And Agwin, as I said, you have different forms, robust statistics and kernel machine sensitivity analysis. But one form I want to point out is actually researcher to research of team to team perturbation. So in climate science, we at least have nine models. So you want to look at the interval prediction of uh, 
global temperature increase using all nine models get 1.5 degrees to 5.5 degrees instead of taking one. So this is scientists already doing this, um, I will call the PCS inference type perturbation intervals instead of, oh, they have to have, you know, a coherent uh, probability structure among the nine models. It's just very pragmatic and it's very informative. So as I said, we make so many judgment calls in the process that it's best to recognize through a documentation that reality is reality, models are mental constructs. It's our job to establish the link, to know which symbols correspond to what reality. And we have to write it down and justify all the judgment calls and provide the bridge, both narratives and uh, data results and in a reproducible format, put on GitHub, R Markdown or Jupyter Notebook. Otherwise, we will be in a broken house. And for precision medicine, the consequence is very severe. If it's not like IT, right? You make more money on average. Individuals don't really matter too much in a way, but here everybody matters. You cannot say on average, I save 10% of life, but that's not enough. We have to control the stability or variability. So everybody minimize the people who get uh, harmed. And often I'm asked the question, how to choose perturbations? So often the perturbations are constrained by computation constraints and human resource constraints that stability can just always look at, in the expo ex look at all the steps, right? Every time you have a fork, you just follow. So you, you should do at least marginal perturbation. That's what we we'll end up doing for this project I'll share. And the good thing of pledging to stability principle is that if you try too many things, you end up with non result So that forces you to really think carefully about the perturbation you should consider. You shouldn't do, you should do enough, but no less. And do documentation to argue for the properness of the perturbations. The perturbation, the general idea is for data perturbation, you want to see the data perturbed as what you could observe or what you can have observed in the future. The adversary attack is not something you observe with the data, but it's what you foresee that when the self-driving vehicle on the road could uh, counter. So you want to use the pseudo kind of data to mimic that situation. So it's very much keeping use P, keeping the future in mind. And um, the, um, Statistical inference can also be expanded under the PCS framework. And I really feel like statistical inference, we don't really have the ability to give conclusive decisions, but it really we should take the view as we provide evidence, one source of evidence and together with domain knowledge. So to help the domain experts do uh, most informed decision making. And therefore, our data evidence should be providing the most transparent manner so the domain and the domain expert can understand and our process. So build trust in our data evidence provided and say, oh, here's a p-value. I don't know what it means, but here's people just follow us. I don't, I don't think they I don't think they follow. Uh, and uh, so, you know, the whole uh, field of psychology already decided not to use p-value. So let's take a critical examination of probabilistic statement in statistical inference. And I have been now not to teach random variable from my applied statistics until like midway through the semester, because actually assuming a random process is assumption. Unless you do randomization explicitly like simple random sampling or a name and Ruby model to do you know, randomizing the patient in two groups, unless the randomization explicit, it's really imagined and it's assumption. So, even using a random variable, you implicitly assuming stability. Why is that? If you only care about data in hand, you don't need a random variable. The random variable is implicitly assuming there could be another situation, there could be another realization of the same random variable that could have been observed, but didn't get either in the future or in the past. So using the symbol of random variable, big X, you're already implying there's another physical situation. You can have another set of data. The two data sets as what you have can be tied together through a random variable. If you cannot imagine that, you should question why you're doing your data analysis. 
And if you don't have a good understanding into where the probability randomness come from, then probability statements are all questionable, right? What does p-value mean? What's the universe you're considering? If it never happened, why should you care? And that this probability never happened. And there's also misspecified. And even in the linear model, you can show that open p-value really measure model bias. You can have a model that had nothing to do with what you're testing on, but have other things and you have projection on it and you're testing that one, not really what you care about. And I'm kind of against using the word true and true model often, I always slip, that's how I was educated in my own lectures. I think it's very misleading. In beginning class, you talk about true model and later you have to tell a student the true is not true. It's just very um, convoluted. We should just talk about postulated and approximate models. And that just convey a much more direct meaning of what we're doing instead of using true and later say it's not true. So the proposed PCS inference is really building on PCS. Use per, uh, prediction check either on validation set or cross validation that to really um, rule out some really bad models. It just doesn't fit data at all. I don't think you want to do a p value, you know, like calculation based on something that doesn't fit the data at all. It's like you have a logistic regression model and the um, unbalanced case that the probability of getting you know, the error rate is 50%. You shouldn't try to interpret the coefficient, right? It doesn't really have any predictability or reality check. Why do you want to test the hypothesis on a particular uh, coefficient? Of course, it's remain to be seen how much we can relax. Of course, if you know the noise ceiling, that's what you want, but often you don't. I still think sometimes even the prediction is not as good as you like, can still have value in interpretation, but I definitely don't think if you interpret any um, like a class of like logistic regression with 50-50 like error rate in a balanced case. And then after you pass that screening, then you evaluate the interest across the pro data model perturbations. It could be across the Sioux and, and the random forest type of model, then you'll be ranking the importance of, of the genes, say, and then they become comparable. And then you can do data perturbation by different split. And then you can come up with confidence intervals. Well, not confidence, and perturbation intervals. As I said, you know, we, we, in the paper, we have a simple study and there, many misspecified models in the linear, like sparse model case, in terms of ranking importance, the PCS performs really well. And surprising, actually, so-called the wrong method. You do the same data, do the Lasso selection, and forget about you did selection, and you do normal approximation to rank the, uh, use the standardized coefficients to rank the uh, importance of the predictors. That works pretty well. That was to my surprise. So this says that, for um, a false discovery rate control, this is not good. But for ranking, which is a lot stable a criteria, actually so-called the wrong method, it's pretty good, better than the post-selection corrected. But of course, post-selection corrected is designed for other purposes. So it's like, what's your purpose? Often, I find most useful in genetic studies, it's about ranking of genes. It's not really controlled about FDR. So now I want to um, share what we just finished, paper just accepted by the International Statistical Review. They have a special issue to celebrate Brad, um, Professor Brad Efren's winning of the International Statistical Prize. So we're invited to uh, for a paper. So the paper is called uh, Statisk, Stable Discovery Interpretable Subgroups uh, via Calibration. So this is very much uh, try to use the principles for causal inference for the first time. So this is really a team of people uh, David and I are kind of the co-senior uh, authors. And then the team is led by my uh, current student, Raz uh, Dervedi and Yang Shu Tan, who is a postdoc and uh, younger student, Brighton Park and an undergraduate Mia Wei, and also a medical physician uh, collaborator, David now, and also join our team, Kevin Hogan. So uh, it's really, the students really uh, impressed me doing lots of lots of stability analysis. 
that I won't be able to share everything, but let me give you a, a hint at what we did. So as I said, this is back to the wild uh, drug. The question is, can we find a subgroup? Because we know that overall, it was put off the market, it was not um, good compared with naproxen in terms of GI event. So uh, it was put off the market. But we're saying that can we watch a subgroup can benefit from this like a selective NSAID drug. So about 20 years ago, the randomized trial was uh, conducted by Merck, about 8,000 patients who already had rheumatoid aristitis. So it's people already not healthy people. And it was conducted in about 300 centers in 22 countries, mostly in the US. And the treatment arms are wilds, the control arm is an older drug, naproxen, who is not a selective uh, NSAID drug. And you can see that in, in terms of the, uh, there are two outcomes. One is CBT for the cardiovascular event, basically a blood clotting, and the other is the GI event, including ulcer bleeding and other um, stomach problems. They are pretty serious problems. And the ATE relative to the uh, control arm, which is another drug, naproxen, um, it seemed to decrease the, the uh, GI event. And, but increased the uh, cardiovascular event. This is all small probabilities. And the question is, um, can we find um, subgroups that for the uh, CT, CVT event that uh, it doesn't hurt in terms of CVT event. So this is some basic notations of the name and Rubin framework. We do assume a superpopulation that um, all these uh, covariates treatment uh, mechanism and the potential outcomes um, kind of ID from that. And the randomized experiment is um, conditioned on the uh, treatment uh, mechanism of TI. You have two, two drugs. And the average treatment effect, it just um, look at, you want to look at the two potential uh, outcome population and want to get that on average, whether one gets better or not. The conditional average treatment effect, Kate, is you condition on the covariant and look at the subgroup and a particular value of X or generalization that is a particular subgroup. So they are kind of related. So what we want to do is use Kate estimates, try to find the subgroup, and which is also interpretable to find out that where you can have something even better than the average treatment effect which is already beneficial, but we want to find something which is even better. Compare with that proxy. There, there's a really a huge number of algorithms to estimate this a conditional every treatment effect. Most of them, actually almost all of them, have a component of, of uh, some uh, decision tree or random forest. So I won't have time to go through, but let me just go like there's S-learner, there's T-learner, X-learner come from um, my group in collaborating with Jesse Kahn's group in Berkeley and Peter Bickle. And uh, our student Soren Cousin was the lead author and also the Stanford R-learner. So this is basically turning the uh, uh, K problem into um, regression supervised learning problem and use machine learning, mental learner. And there's also directly use tree-based method and use causal split conditions. So you, you, you use the outcome to split instead of using, you know, the, the um, just the covariates. So it's causal tree, causal forest, and BART, and BCF. The problem with the Kate model is that we have so many choices, as I've said, right? There are many, many different ways. And each method, X learner, you can also put in different components and that was many too, and there's hyperparameter tuning. And the problem with uh, validation of causal model is that for each individual, you really care about the difference, but you only observe one of them. So you have to do some aggregation. So we end up using um, uh, calibration, basically group them. And um, our test set is pretty, no loss is pretty noisy because we have very small sample size. It's GI events and the CBT events are both uh, rare events. And uh, the validation are nowhere integral, either use R-square or uh, AUC-curve. 
So our contribution in this part is that we really extended the PCS framework in the original paper um, from supervised learning to causal studies. And then we um, basically use calibration-based predictive checks for k models. And we developed this uh, stat disk methodology, did many different uh, ways of uh, I'll call reasonable perturbations and model perturbations. We ended up with 17 different k models, and we did at least seven different data perturbations, including feature engineering step that how well you cut age or what's older people and younger people. So we did a lot of, but mostly marginal. We didn't do the all possible exponential exploding kind of perturbation due to computation constraints. And to a really, really um, nice surprise, oh, um, we're very pleased that after we finished everything, even submitting the first version of the paper, we had access to the approved study and validated our, um, the, we have six subgroups and four of them were validated. Two of them, the approved studies didn't have any events. So basically um, there's no, nothing to say one way or the other. So nothing refuted our findings. So in the future engineering step, we actually end up some of the uh, features already binary and others we binarize it and the threshold, we did a marginal perturbation to try different threshold, two thresholds. So we have five demographic uh, uh, binary features and we have lifestyle features. We did the binarization and obesity, we use MBI, uh, BMI to binarize. And then we have um, six, nine uh, read medical risk factors that already binaries. In the PCS framework, data perturbation is a key part. I mean, we always have the 17 different models, right? And the way we did it is we set the test set, the dark blue side, about 20% never touch until the end. Within the, um, the remaining 80%, we first fix the validation fold and then for the remaining, we did three different random splits. So we'll end up with 12, we call perturbation settings. Okay, so we, we keep doing that. So for each setting, we have a validation test and we have different folds. And uh, this is a judgment call, I have to agree, but that's what we decide to do. So you can never completely remove the judgment call, but um, the proof is in the pudding that it's really the validation external study by approved. Okay, so that's what, what I mean, 12 settings is, 12 data perturbation settings. And for each of them setting, we actually use P and S, right? We, we perturb you three times, and then we use the validation to evaluate some predictive performance. Test is really set aside until the last minute. So let's look at the X learner. This is a particular learner with the base learner random forest and cross learner. That's a detail I won't have time to get, but it's a particular version of the X learner from my group. It was very interesting. And to, to a pretty end, actually, this um, group of people didn't want to use X learner. They thought it would be very similar. For me, I was just curious to see how our pre -work, previous work worked. It turned out to work really well. So I was very pleased. But my student in the beginning didn't want to use it. I was like, well, let's try it. I want to learn how this method works in a different context. And turned out to be, we end up liking six of them. I think four or five of them actually it's different versions of X learner. So what do we have here? We cut the data into based on um, a particular feature, I think it's age, into um, like um, five subgroups. And then we, on the training set, and we have particular Kate, and then we aggregate because for the, for the subgroup, we actually have the uh, difference in means estimate or we'll call the name and Kate without any modeling, and we can compare. So we have training folds that's on the left and the validation fold on the right. You can see on the training fold, the model capture on this matched uh, subsets work pretty well, but there's more events on the validation set, right? So this is for one one particular case, we have 17 of them. And for each case, we divide this generalization of uh, our square on the test set. So they can be from negative infinity to one. The idea is very simple. You compare with your model average with the name and average, and this is just waiting for the sizes. And, and then the other one is like, you just look at the average case and relative to 
the subgroup name and k. So it's kind of borrowing from ANOVA or uh, linear regression from the explained variant by using L1. So you end up with R squared using the validation set. And this can be negative. The, the closer to one, the better. And we have 17 such models. And then we have, remember, 12 data perturbation. For each, we can do this calculation. So you can look at most of the time for the GI events. It's negative. It's not so good, right? And for the uh, cardiovascular event, also it's a lot of negative. So this is just saying that in general, all the K models, the generalization are not that great, looking, taking everybody together. So what we do is that by the bottom quantile, right, if you look at this plot, right, you can see that there's much clearer evidence. The average is minus 1.6, but for the first group, first quantile, you have minus 4, minus 6. So that's really clear signal. So maybe that's a group with you. But this is for a particular method, right? Uh, we'll have different groups. So we um, look at all 17 other models. The bottom group always pretty much the same. I was wrong. I was dividing the, the group based on the predictive uh, uh, Kate estimate. I was wrong. It's not uh, uh, stratified based on age. It's stratified based on vertical stratification on the, the values, predictive values, or the Kate values. And that pattern is consistent. But for different models, you cut vertically the top and the bottom group. You end up with different axes, so different groups. And that's what the next step we have to do is can we consolidate the different Kate model to identify stable groups across the 17 models and different 12 data perturbations? And the, the next step, how can we turn such group if you cut uh, on the vertical in terms of response, you're not going to end up with nicely um, um, like uh, regions. And we try to use the more integral regions of uh, like a Boolean sets to uh, approximate such set to make them integral. So what we end up doing is that for each group, we look at the validation and we divide this t-statistic, and it's an indication of how well uh, this model work for a particular um, g. And this g now you're taking the bottom group again, use and bottom ten percent, twenty percent, and so on. Forth. The last one I showed you was actually uh, like non-overlapping. This is overlapping groups. We just want to see that this uh, particular cut is not arbitrary. And then we use one perturbation, which is the cross validation, and compare the 17 model uses average t value. And then we have other six different ways of perturb. Like we have two additional random splits of training sets for cross validation. And also we have a time enrollment time based split. This is more meaningful, more try to mimic external validation. And then we have feature engineering perturbation. How do we cut elderly versus? BMI cut, and then we can also slightly perturb the definition with the GI event. So end up with other um, six perturbations. So that's the T value, all the T values I showed you. And then what we did is that we look at each column and look at the top the ranking of this 17 message and see which one got into the top 10, like the up half. And it turns out these six models seem to be consistently, it doesn't matter what perturbation we, we, we used, one of the columns, they consistently appear to the top 10 across different perturbations. So you can see end up there are four X learners and two are T learners. T learners Basically, you fit different random forests uh, for the treatment and control group, and then you do the uh, averaging. I know you do the difference. So that's why we talk, take the top six models. And then we use this ensemble six models to look at the bottom groups for, 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 for the GI event. And then we have a whole search to look for interpretable models, which we said only will depend on three of the 16 features and it's Boolean. And it's quite sure we have some other requirements and, and search algorithm to find them. 
So we use PCS and did a lot of PNS for every step and many perturbations and six, 17 models. And we find this ensemble top models, what are called ensemble six, and we did Seltzer to make it into Boolean based uh, kind of subgroups. And that they are the clinical interval subgroups. So what we find is that for the GI event, if the person have a history of GI event, YOX seem to have really reduced the GI risk if the patient already have a history of GI event. Another subgroup, they do have some overlap, now huge of the three uh, groups. If you have, so the patient had a history of hypertension or prior usage of steroids, right? This is NSAID, so this is not a st steroid-based um, uh, anti-inflammatory drug. Then also, the, um, your GI event is also reduced by Wilox. Or older age and prior use of steroids. So these are the three groups. They, they do have overlap. And you look at the cardiovascular event, that this is bad. The Wilox will increase the vascular, uh, cardiovascular event. You have history of Osteosclerosis. This is really the sickening of the, the war, the heart war, due to plaque, like a fat deposition and the cholesterol and things like that. So if you have those problem already, taking Vioxx because it's really stopped the, the blood thinner from working, then things will get worse. And if you have usage your aspirin, because I think FDA have to require you to report that, that it's also bad for you. That means you probably indicate you already have a problem of a blood clotting. That's why you probably use aspirin. And older age or male gender is also a risk factor. And, um, but for the last group, for the test set, remember this is all made using the training and validation set. And then when you look at the test set, the last one didn't really hold up. It's because there's no re event, so we cannot really ver verify that. So this is all done with one study. And we already submitted the first version of the paper and actually was accepted. And then we asked the permission to add more information because we felt like it really strengthened the paper to see what we did. It's uh, valid. A lot of the problems, even randomized clinical trials, that they are the gold standard for clinical research. But as Cochrane said in 1971, between measurements based on our randomized clinical trials and benefit in the community, there's a gulf which has been much underestimated. Because as you saw in the Wild trial, it was the people already with uh, aristitis disease, right? So already um, people have you know problems and they're not a random selected um, patients. And for another study, it's other kind of uh, people with other kind of problem. So the question is really now modern machine learning trying to call the transfer learning in medical literature called uh, external uh, validity. So whether the two populations, you have the two trials, are they comparable? And there could be also different outcomes of interest. So the approval of a study was randomized uh, placebo control trial. Remember the first trial I talked about was um, naproxen, was an older drug. This is a smaller uh, trial with about 2,500 patients. But these people have history of colorectal polyps. So they're saying that better, the primary interest here to see Wiox will actually help reduce the number of polyps. But from the information related to the trial, we could really find, find information on GI event, so make it comparable. The primary purpose of this trial is not about GI event. So they want to know whether um, wild reduce the risk of polyps, individuals who already have a history of recent tumors. And because the high we already saw that from the Wilox trial. The, this happened here too. High cardiovascular toxicity of Wilox. So the trial was terminated two months early and resulted in the withdrawal of drug from the market. 
So as I mentioned, this is just a comparison. But similarly, um, approval started after the Vigor trial finished. And the population are different patients' populations with different medical problems. And the primary focus was different. And the control arm was different. But the approval uh, trial had in my information, we basically uh, can find out the GI events. Uh, of course, it's, we, it's, it's a particular way we define it with certain terms related to the GI events. And with this matching, you can see that the wilds compared with naproxen really reduced the GI event. But increase in the approval trial from the control, which is a placebo. So it's likely, which is these two problems, that, but one conjecture is that the wilds still make GI event worse compared with placebo, but it's better than the GI event induced by naproxen, which is uh, another selective uh, NSAID uh, drug. And for the uh, cardiovascular event, that you can see that uh, the, um, it does increase compared with the arm and increase more compared with the placebo. And the, the, um, the uh, base rate of placebo uh, group already have a pretty high rate of uh, cardiovascular event. So I think if we didn't do the interoperability step from the subgroup, this uh, find from I'll call the top eight uh, Kate estimate, which we made it ensemble, it's a very irregular pattern, right? If you cut any surface vertically, you're gonna end up with very irregular shape. But the approximation of that irregular shape by uh, interoperable subgroups really help because otherwise these regions are not as easily transferable but these interval subgroups are very interval transferable. So I think that's really advantage of going for interoperability for transport learning, which is very much based on stability. Um, that we ask the question, do the subgroup found um, by a stat disk for the vigor study generalize to the approved study? So the one um, line summary is that mostly yes. Four after the six groups, show significant heterogeneous treatment effect in the proof study. And for the other two, just don't have data to, to, to say one way or the other. So basically that's what, uh, even for the test, remember the older male age for our test data was not really, there's no data in our own test, but it got uh, kind of supported by the proof study. And for the, the two without the check marks, this, just very small, no event. There are very small subgroup in the proof study and um, we don't see any event, so just no information. So this was very, very um, nice. Um, we're very pleased that uh, the subgroups we found actually got uh, externally uh, supported, I would say. Validated maybe too strong a word because very different study, very different patient groups. So to summarize, I'm really advocating the vertical data science or trustworthy AI through the PCS framework and with two components of workflow and documentation, really seeing the data science lifecycle as a holistic uh, system involving human beings. And then showed you a study using the PCS from extended to causal uh, studies from supervised learning. And I want to emphasize the importance of domain knowledge. I mean, with Kevin, David knows a lot already, but Kevin really is a physician, really knows both trials really well, was super helpful. And we, the PCS used on the original data really generate the testable uh, hypothesis, either for wild life experiments with some genomic work, we have been doing that, and here for other studies, for the all kind of external validations. So it's really using PCS as hypothesis generation on our cause scientific recommendation system. And again, I want to thank my group who really, especially the people on the team, uh, really have been really, really patient and persistent and to really carry out because stability analysis is really, really just a lot to keep track and just want to do it. And um, my group is really focused on solving real problems in the context of domain knowledge and really 
train students with critical thinking, get on top of algorithms, and write well, communicate well. When the next group meeting actually is on visualization. So we want people to communicate, and we're now coming back to relevant data, both for random uh, forest and also for some deep learning. And this PCS framework is very much the guiding principle of our new textbook, which will be published by MIT Press with my um, former student, Karen Posel, Rebecca Butter, really try to make a very practical uh, kind of uh, approach to data science. And uh, we'll have an online free, free online version early next year, and the paper version probably will come out end of the year. So watch out. The name of the book is the same as the title called the Vertical Data Science. And the papers at my website. And um, thank you. Thank you. Um, John had to step out. This is his uh, teaching now. So I think so. Uh, I'll be uh, uh, doing the Q and A. Uh, so um, if anyone from the participants wants to ask a question, uh, you can use the Q and A uh, box. Um, I have a few questions to start with. Um, and um, yeah, so um, I'm just thinking in which order. Uh, at some moment, you mentioned adversarial errors. Errors. Uh, you know, the questions are definitely biased by kind of my you know, perspective as a computer scientist, I guess. Uh, I was just curious um, to what degree is uh, adversarial errors an issue, let's say, in, in precision medicine, for example? Uh, as in, no, presumably, uh, uh, you know, other situations where you should think about the errors or the data being um, noised adversarially or not really. I'm sorry, I, I, can you repeat the question? I didn't quite get the question. Uh, adversarial examples? Uh, to what degree should we be expecting that there could be adversarially noised examples in the data, let's say, for, you know, in precision medicine uh, area, for example? So the question is, to what degree the data has noise? Uh, adversarial noise, right? I mean, is there... So what? I didn't get that word. What adversarial, the... adversary. I, I, I'm not catching that word, yeah. Uh, like worst case noise, uh, right? Like taking a stop sign and making it look like an elephant uh, by small perturbation. I mean, adverse you, adverse. I think th there was some worry about people going in and try to add this adversity noise to medical images and then charge um, Medicare unreasonably, right? There was some article people concerned with that. So adversary, uh, in my uh, study, we haven't worried about adversary attacks uh, in the precision medicine, but there was, uh, remember I read, there was um, concern from maybe the deep learning um, researchers that people in theory could get hacked into a medical uh, imaging database and start adding some adversary noises. And, um, and then they can charge, oh, they, the, the, the medical you know, doctor could do that themselves and then get classified as disease and charge Medicare, I see. for example. Okay. Yeah, so that's why. So in, in general, the alteration of uh, medical records, I don't think it's really a concern right now but and I don't know how realistic these medical images will be altered and attacked, but it's conceivable. I see. Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely if somebody hacks, I mean, I, I definitely imagine like, you know, things becoming adversarial. I, I, I guess I was thinking even not necessarily in that case, and perhaps, uh, you know, maybe for context, uh, uh, you know, just to, to, to relate to something else that you mentioned that, you know, when you teach, random variables is not necessarily the first thing that you want to teach because, well, you know, we have a data set, right? And, you know, it's not necessarily that it generated from, I don't know, Gaussian distribution, let's say, right? Um, so in a sense, I'm just wondering what what is the, you know, if not assuming that we are random, right? What do we assume? And I, I you know, I come from computer science and, you know, theoretical computer science, so in a sense, this is what we do kind of at the beginning, that we don't think that data coming from a distribution, but it's worst case. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't lead to the best solutions, kind of. So, kind of requires yeah. further assumptions. So, my suggestion is that at least recorded and recognized, I actually don't know what it means here, but if you have ways to do prediction validated, 
then you're fine, right? So, so it's really the evaluation. So there are two ways to make your process rigorous. One is you justify the assumptions, right? That's what you should always try to do. And right. you can just say that, I don't know, but let me just run through it. But you need to have a, a, like a performance metric and prove empirically to say that it works, right? Mm -hmm. So that's legitimate. But if you don't have either, that's the problem, <laughs> right? Sometimes you can justify things just because in physics, that all their assumptions with prior physics knowledge are pretty validated. So you, you might be get, you can get away from less empirical validation because everything you do, every step seems to be very on solid ground. Oh, you don't have much a beginning, but you have the end, but you don't have either. That's where I think it's really concerned. Right, right. But it's still good. Even you don't have something just write down, say that I try to think about this data generation process and at least identify the sources of uh, randomness. It just, I found it very helpful thought experiment to go through. And later, it's very when things don't work, you can come back and think it through and document it. But then you really need to say, I cannot back it up by ground up, but I better back it up. But in terms of it's useful and what's the evidence, it's useful. I see. Uh, yeah. So it's good uh, to have both, but at least you need to have one. So I'm curious, what is, um, well, I guess in, in physics, in a sense, the, the validation is kind of clear, you know, you come up with a, you know, Newton's law, right? And then you can make up predictions, theoretical predictions out of it, right? Then you go run experiment. What does it mean in, 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 in let's say, in precision, in, in precision medicine? What, what does it mean to, you, you know, if it increases by a few percent, the, the probability of a bad event, you know, by taking this medicine, uh, would validation mean to actually run this experiment or what exactly would validation? I think there's a lot of like regulation involved, right? So that's where it's very unclear okay. that all oh, this AI, I mean, that's the thing, right? I think there's a lot of legal responsibility. The most of the AI system is really as an aid. And then the doctor takes the whole responsibility. So you basically have to convince the doctors why they should trust your system. And FDA, I think still probably working on regulation, how to approve. Uh, I was talking to a, um, a startup founder who want her uh, deep learning medical imaging kind of uh, analysis to pass FDA. And she said the, the FDA was asking for interpretability. So I think FDA is still going through on the regulation, what AI system to prove or not to approve. And the doctors as a community have been, because they eventually have to bear the responsibility so far um, if something goes wrong. So, um, so one way is like whatever we provide them, it's just like they read another academic paper, they all do and take the full responsibility. So, um, but, um, so I think all these external validations, I think a lot of doctors already want to see. Uh, that's a step. But really where to cut this, I don't think the field has gone to that precision yet to have go to that quantitative level. And it's a lot of data, try to get data together, try to develop system, try to provide uh, ED like uh, visualization for the doctor more as an aid. And that I think is a lot of local human decisions, whether their department say, department of medicine collective. So this is something we should try. So I don't think there's a uniform uh, standards yet. That would be good to have that articulate. We recently wrote a paper with a bunch of other people called uh, I My Claim. It's really say that for AI in medical research, these are the things, the minimum you should satisfy. So it's kind of going for the minimum instead of saying that how to pass FDA. Okay. So yeah, I don't think we're there yet. Yeah, it's not as precise and there's a legal responsibility. Of course, of course. Um, yeah. yeah, but uh, and, and this, I, I guess, connects to another question, but I, I was wondering, um, I mean, of, of course, the other, you know, rather than, you know, here, here is kind of a prediction, rather than, uh, you know, trying it on, on patients, one can verify against kind of an existing data set already, right? Um, and, but then, uh, of course, the worry is, you know, how does this mesh with, you know, this uh, adaptive data analysis and kind of it pitfalls that, you know, we try the models until it works by kind of pure chance as opposed to 
it is really predictive. How does this connect to adaptive data analysis? Um, I think data adaptive analysis is going to take a long time because right now, all the even the traditional drug approval, you need to write a very clear analysis and everything. They don't want you to be too adaptive, actually. You can write for subgroup analysis. So there's strict regulations about how much you allow to adapt. I see. So, so I think the adaptive analysis will have to follow those regulations. Within the regulations, probably it's, it's doable, but not beyond the re regulations, right? You have to really lay out the complete analysis pipeline before you get the clinical trial approved. Right? Oh, I, see. I see. So they really want you, they don't want you to, to be too adaptive. But sometimes you can write a revision to ask for some, some subgroup analysis. And then you also need approval. So you can do adaptive analysis with every step adaptation needs approval by a by a FDA committee. I see. But it won't be up to you, which is good, right? You have oversight. Of course, of course, of course. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about another step, like, okay, you know, that study is done and there is lots of results recorded. Are those so is the data kind of forbidden to be used for any other kind of modeling and predictive analysis or? Well, right now, all the clinical trial data, I mean, we work with David, that's why we have access to both data. It's very hard to access clinical, good clinical trial data. I see. Because so it's of- now like, It's now like uh, ImageNet, right? Everybody right. Um, can access. So that's already, yeah, without David, we wouldn't be able to access this data. I see. So this, in a sense, limits the adaptability and the issues. What? But limits the adaptability, kind of, to how much yeah. you adapt. Yeah, to the yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because I think it's, this is all drug companies, right? They don't want probably this data to be later used against them, or they only want the people who they trust, who at least not maliciously use against them, right? So because a lot of uh, financial interests in here too, right? So. Uh, so that's, I mean, I think NIH is supposed to have a website on clinical trial. I've, I've, I, we haven't been able to find anything we can use, so right, not easy to access. So we haven't been able to, my understanding that you really have, need people who closely work on clinical trial and they have access. All the data in my joint paper uh, have been able to access all through somebody who kind of really somehow connected with these clinical trials. I see, I see. Yeah. Um, so just I, I, are there other questions? I see three. I cannot see it. Oh, the question. Do, do you see three? Uh, I see three. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh, this is from Alexis. That's fine. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, I was looking. Uh, yeah, I don't see the questions in in the chat. Uh, okay. I yeah. Think a little over time, so thank you very much for your participation. Um, and we will have a recording available within the next 24 hours, and I'll begin to circulate it as well. Okay, thank you for having me. Okay, yeah. thanks again, Tim. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Bye bye. Bye. bye.